Have a seat. Awesome. Hey guys, we're here uh, another Sunday and uh, well, welcome to Connect Church. Thanks for the guys for, for running those earlier parts. Uh, as Matt said, it's, uh, it's great to have you here. So welcome back, friends, family. And uh, a special welcome to those that have joined us uh, for maybe your first time this morning. How about a, a real Connect welcome? And of course, a massive welcome to those joining us online either right now at this moment or those that join later on. Thank you so much for connecting with us. And so here at Connect Church, absolutely passionate about many things. Here's, here's the top four. Number one is loving Christ. Number two, experiencing community. Three, getting equipped to live out our God-designed influence. Okay, so today here we are talking about stewardship, and this is an area around influence. What is it that God has given to us, and then what do we do with that? Okay, so last week we really dug into what, uh, can we get the, the slides up there, Indy, thanks. Last week we, we dug into what stewardship was all about, what that word stewardship meant. And today I want to talk about stewarding our space, steward your space, steward my space. And so to be able to do that, I want to do a bit of a search and understanding around what space means. And uh, in doing that, I actually want to talk about uh, the space man who's given us a great example on, first of all, how to navigate space, how to travel through space and what that looks like. So here we go, the definition of space, and I've narrowed it down to the ones that are most pertinent about what we're talking around today. So definition of space is a period of time, it's duration. So space is a a measurement of time. Number two, space can be a a measurement in either one, two, or three dimensions, whether you're measuring distance or in two dimension area or in three dimensions volume. So we've got two different versions of measurement here in time and in uh, distance, area, or volume. Uh, Number three is an extent set apart. So a set-apart space, it could be a parking space, Uh, it could be a floor space, that's what space could mean. And number four is personal space. Who loves personal space? Who's loving um, having this 1.5 thing going on and just that little bit more comfort? You know those people where you've got to, when you're talking to them, you kind of got to put your foot like this and stand back because they just keep on coming in. Well, space could mean that space that you need to feel comfortable. It's another definition of space. It's, a, it's an internal and intentional way of making space. So when we look at space then and, and understanding it in that context, let's think about the space man. The definition of a space man is a visitor to earth from outer space. One who travels outside the atmosphere, and three, a person trained for traveling in space. I reckon Jesus has got to be the ultimate spaceman, right? He come from outer space. He come into. He, he contravened all space and time, and he came at a certain time and place and occupied that space. Came as God, but fully man. And then left. (laughs) But he's a person trained for traveling in space. And if we consider what these space definitions are, he was someone trained in traveling time, in understanding how to navigate time well. I'm not talking about back to the future. I'm talking about we've each got an allocation of time that we've got to steward well. And what I get from Jesus is he nailed it. And he's given us a blueprint on how we can live our lives as well. That Jesus came from outer space. He he came and he definitely interrupted what we were up to here in our time. And he definitely um, went back. But what my prayer is today is that we would be people that would be Christ-like. And that we would be better at traveling in our space, in our allotment, in our stewardship in our dominion, our area of control, or as we say at Connect Church, our area of influence. Because there's people who are Christ-like, seeing Christ operate so well in His dominion, we too are called to be Christ-like, operate in that space. One of the first commandments God gave mankind was to have dominion. 
And it's one of the first things that the enemy sought to take away from us was that dominion. It was that clear understanding of what and how to occupy within that space. So this is what we're going to talk about today. And what I've done is I've tried to make it really, really easy. And look, when Jesus, um, when he tried to clarify the, the law and the prophets, he did it in two areas. So I thought today, when we're looking at MySpace, uh, for those that are millennial-ish, you probably remember MySpace. Um, but I wanted to like, narrow it down into two areas. When we're looking at occupying and operating within our space, it's first understanding what do I do. Bible tells us that we're each members of a body. So some of us Fingers, toes, hands, legs, eyes, ears. And it's understanding that as much as an eye wants to be an ear, it's nowhere near as effective. Now, yes, there's times when people that are blind, their hearing is increased to the point where it almost paints a picture for them and it creates a sight. But if you've got all of the faculties there and available, it's poor usage of the ear to be an eye. Do we understand that? And so applying that in our world, it's what do I do? How do I be the me that God created me to be? Oh, I did that. That was cool. And so the way I say it is how well do I will? And you're not measured to that. That's a different measure. Okay? There's a different measure upon your life. You're given a measure. And that measure is you. How well are you carrying out and fulfilling the call of God upon your life? One of the most incredible things I read in the Bible is where God speaks from heaven and says of Jesus, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That Jesus was living his definition of Jesus as God had mapped it out and called it to be. And we all know those times when we try and, and live out another person's version. Like as much as I want to play the guitar and grow a beard and have long hair, I can't be Chris. I could try. But look, maybe it's a really good thing as well. I don't know if the world could handle any more Chris. There's a beauty in Chris being Chris, and it just is not quite so beautiful if, if I go that way, right? And, and so often at times we can see other people and we can see the way other people are doing things, and we can see someone else's income, and we can have a desire, and, and, a, and a, oh, I want, I want to be that, I want to do that, but what do I do? And part two is, what do I don't? What don't I do? What are the areas that I should set apart and make room for? Give a bit of space rather than trying to force things outside of their time or place and make a little bit of room for things to happen. That, that second part there is where, for example, we sleep. There's a lot of healing that takes place in sleep. A lot of people aren't living in the fullness of the health that's available to them because they don't get enough sleep. And there's lots of areas in our life when we don't make room, we miss out on the revitalization. We miss out on the rest. We miss out on the restoration. We miss out on the healing that's already there and available for us if we simply make room for it today. And so we need to understand how to steward my space. This is what we've got our call for us to do. So going through Scripture and understanding what is it that I do and what is it that I don't, what is it that I do? See, Jesus was brilliant at this. In Matthew 15, 24, Jesus is speaking to a woman that is not of Jewish heritage. And what could be seemingly to us quite rude and cutthroat is actually life that we enjoy today. What I mean by that is Jesus is performing miracles and, and giving great encouragements to people. And a woman comes to him and says, my daughter is severely demon-possessed. And Jesus said, would you take from the little children, would you as a dog steal the food from the little children? And it's amazing what this woman responds is says, well, just give me the leftovers because you're Jesus, that's just enough. 
But what Jesus is actually doing, the focus here, is he's getting very clear on what he was supposed to do. And we see here that in context, 1524, Jesus answers and says, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Another example of this is the Pharisees are trying to force Jesus to be someone. They're trying to force him to to do things that they think he should do. Jesus is hanging out. He's just gone and Matthew, the tax collector, or Levi, also known as, has just given up his dishonest gain and decided to follow Jesus. He's so overwhelmed and excited about this life-transforming event that's just taken place. He, He just throws this party at his house and it's full of people just like him full of tax collectors and sinners, and and many of them yet hadn't really come across the line to say, Jesus is my Lord. They're just like, I can't believe what's happened to Matthew. Man, this guy is just crazy. Jesus goes out and has lunch with them, and the Pharisees and Sadducees, the lawyers, the religious people, they start to get indignant about this and say, look at this guy hanging out with the sinners. Jesus responds, I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. These are very powerful statements where Jesus is saying, this is who I am. This is what I've come and been called to do. And when we understand in context, for example, even Peter. So of those that are following Jesus, Jesus picks 12. Of those 12, he picked one to carry on his mission and to lead the church after he was gone. This guy's name's Peter. Jesus is giving the spoiler alert on what's to come. He's just telling the disciples that he's got to be crucified. He's got to die for the sins of the world. And Peter says, far be it from you that this should happen and starts to rebuke Jesus. And Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. He is so clear on what he has to do that he just will not accept anything to the contrary. And interestingly, when Jesus was tempted by Satan, one of the temptations, he said, bow down to me and I will give you the whole nations of the earth. What we can see in Jesus being specific to the Jewish people is that us Gentiles are blessed as a result. You see, if Jesus went about and tried to be all things to all people and and just did everything for everybody and was not specific, if he tried to save the world, I don't know that the world would have been saved. But he came through and he was unique and specific and did his call and spoke directly to the Jewish people on behalf of the Gentiles. Isn't that amazing? That because Jesus was so specific in what his yes was, we're blessed. And you know what? The same is true in our life when we're willing to be super clear on what it is that God calls us to do. And when we do it because God called it, the things that we say no to end up being a blessing. As we see in Romans 1.16, Paul says to the Jew first and also the Gentile that there was a blessing in the way that it happened. There was a blessing in in what was supposed to happen there. You see, Jesus embraced limits. He embraced boundaries. He allowed the boundaries of the call on his life to come to and through the Jewish people for the whole world. And because of that, we are blessed. Jesus' mission to the Jews was not at the expense of the Gentiles. It was his focus, though. Next, we look at what we don't. Have a look at this in Luke 4, 42 to 43. It says, Now when it was day, he being Jesus, departed and went to a... I think I heard louder from the people online. (laughs) Jesus went to a... Thanks, guys. You can give yourselves a round of applause. You can give yourselves a round of applause. Anyway, let's keep going. It was day Jesus departed, went to a deserted place. And the crowd sought him and came to him. They tried to keep him from leaving. (laughs) How often do people try and just keep you for themselves? 
keep, keep the, the goodness and that, that value and box you in and, and, and maintain you. Jesus said, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also because for this purpose I have been sent. Jesus had no problems in saying no to what was important and necessary to say no to. These people wanted a good thing. They wanted more of Jesus. But he knew and he occupied his space in time and in location and knew where he needed to be, when he needed to be there. Gave the right amount of time to the people at the right time. And in Matthew 5.39, Jesus actually says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. He's talking about making oaths, but here's, here's the kicker. That everything we say no to empowers what we say yes to. Our yes is more powerful when we say no. Now, this is not the disclaimer to go around and say no to everything. Because it's so easy to say no to the things of God. Or is it just me? It's so easy just to to flip off and to dismiss things and just to say, oh, no, 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 no. But it's when we say no to the distractions. It's when we say no to the good intentions. When we say no to the extra. And we say yes to the unique and the specific from God that it's powerful. Let your yes be yes and your no be be no, is just clarifying what is it that you call, what is it that you do, what is it that you don't. And I feel like often we can get so confused and caught up in saying no to the right things and yes to the wrong things. Anyone like me who's a particularly proficient gardener, um, what I mean by that is that I kill things that should grow and the weeds go just next level, it can be quite symbolic of life, right? How easy is it for the weeds to accumulate and grow in our life, for the things that are distractions and that aren't for our best, for us to say yes to them? And so what Jesus did is he was so super intentional about what he did and what he he didn't do, and he empowered his yes. He filled his life with the right yes by saying no to the wrong things. See, Jesus embraced margin. And so if we're looking at what I do and what I don't, I find two words give us a really great framework to help to understand this. Now, who loves boundaries? Oh, okay. (laughs) Most of us are rebellious. You can tell. Because as kids, we just don't do what we're told. And we just become bigger kids when we get older and we're looking for ways of getting around things. But boundaries are beautiful. And Jesus embraced boundaries. Jesus embraced many boundaries and he's given many boundaries for us. But what we can see from Jesus in going to a deserted place and in saying no to the things he shouldn't have is he created margin. And I look at the call of Jesus, that in the boundaries of coming as a man, he actually suffered greatly. Jesus experienced every emotion, every heartache, every sickness, every brokenness that we could even imagine, more than what we'll ever experience. Jesus took them on. He embraced the boundaries and limitations of humankind, to bring about complete freedom for us. And he, he, he saw beauty in boundaries. In the creation, in the Genesis account, God said that he gives the water boundaries, that it can come thus far and no further. And we look at the tides, and the tides come in and they go out, but they follow the law of boundaries. And yet many of us become so rebellious of boundaries that happen in our life and we throw off restraint and the things that are meant to be a blessing in our world become a curse. There's something really powerful about setting boundaries and about making margin in our world. I want to talk to you about boundaries. And one of the best examples of good boundaries I can think of is fire. Now, if you consider at the time of Jesus, fire not only gave warmth and heat 
and food, like where you cook from, but it also gave light. They didn't have the, the, the beauty of electricity that we have today. But fire unrestrained is dangerous. And many of us have fire, have a beautiful blessing in our world that needs boundaries to be beautiful. And we don't embrace the boundaries and it burns us. Here's an example. Sex. Sex is a great blessing and a beautiful thing given by God himself. And yet not in the confines of the boundaries that he set out burns. And we're often hearing of great abuses that happen. Not just overseas, but even here in Australia. That's a big ticket item, but what about some small stuff? Maybe food for you because of a limit or a lack of boundaries that are in place has become a burden. We eat too much of the wrong thing at the wrong time. Maybe work for you is a blessing become burden because you haven't put in the best boundaries to make it a blessing. And see, what happens is when we don't have boundaries is it creeps over into another space and we end up playing space invaders. We've got our family zone. Well, if, if those that are the married with a family, so I'm talking about myself here, I've got my family zone and I've got my, my husbanding zone and I've got my work zone and I've got all of these different zones, friend zone. And there's all these different zones and spaces that I've got. And when you neglect one and you let the others invade the space, it becomes a problem. And anything that could be a blessing without boundaries ends up burning. I feel like today's message is brought to you by the letter B. <laughs> there's so many things that this can happen with. Um, any types of addiction, drugs, even prescription ones, designed to be a, a blessing and to help out when they're not operated within boundaries become a major problem. It's like setting up flags at the beach when you go swimming. You want to know when you're drifting, when you're drifting into another space that could potentially be dangerous. The beauty of the flags at the beach for where you're supposed to be swimming is people that know better have already scouted out the safe land. And friends, that's what mentoring is. And that's what the Bible is, is that God has gone before us and he's like, hey, there's blessings on this side. Well, it's actually blessings are on the right hand side. So I was right for your right hand, but wrong for my left hand. Blessings on the right hand, curses on the left hand. And he said, here, here's the ways of life. Let me give you some precepts. Let me give you some understanding. Let me give you some boundaries. So when you drift from them, you can go, oh, this is going to burn. This is going to get me in trouble. I'm going to struggle. I'm in out of my depth here. You know, interestingly, the stats are coming in at the moment before summer and the lifeguards are warning, hey guys, please swim between the flags and have caution. Majority of people, 75% of people that drown are males under the age of 50. Because males have a higher tendency to throw off restraint and to push boundaries and to look for loopholes. And so here's an encouragement and a challenge this morning is to be careful because boundaries keep you from bondage. Bondage is the things that hold you down and weigh you down unnecessarily. Obviously, there's a really good linkage with food there and being weighed down unnecessarily when we don't have good boundaries there. But this is not just the case with food. It's in anything that we let creep out of the space, and we end up trapped or in places and spaces we don't want to be. But here's the good thing about margin, is that margin gives us the space for options. You know, like there's some people that have experienced some real hardship in the last 18 months. And one person that I just think is an absolute champion has gone into a season and built up a financial buffer, a financial margin. So when this person lost their job, they weren't flapping around and just taking any old job that came in is they would able to go to God and wait and they had margin in their life to not be forced into a decision unnecessarily. But how often is it that we are rushed and forced into a decision that's not the best for us because of a lack of margin? Now let's understand this in understanding limitations. 
One of the greatest limitations on Will Smith is a sense of direction. I'm just going to surrender my man card now. There's no point in even trying. It's just one of the things I struggle with and always struggle with. But here's something that God's been working on me through the years is this thing called margin. And what it means is if I give myself space, both in time and emotions, to be okay with the limitations that are me, I actually operate really well there. And the beauty in the limitation is I find God in a unique way. This might not seem like a big thing to you, but when I need to be somewhere on a certain time, and I've got this thing where I like to be on time, when I get lost on the way, I lose control. There is like a whole nother vocabulary that just like, it it sounds like the Tassie devil. It's like, (laughs) I am so angry and I just got no control. And there's people in front. I'm like, get out of my way. And I'm like, God, why did you make me such a misfit? I can't believe I don't know where I'm supposed to be going. The turnoff was there. And I was, I had a job for a whole year traveling Australia, taking multimedia shows into high schools. We didn't have Google Maps. We had paperback maps. And it was just two people. And at times where I'd have to go driving and and work it out, I'd have to look at the map and I'd have to do this. And I I don't have the greatest memory for that type of detail. And I remember the worst thing was one time I was going to catch up with a friend. I'm driving into Sydney. And this turn was the last turn before you go over the bridge into the city itself. I missed the turn. 4.45, I missed the turn. 15 minutes later, I was able to find a way of turning back and coming back along the other road. But any time after four o'clock, no right turn. It took me 45 minutes plus to try and get down the street that I missed. Whereas today, I'm, I'm not quite as tazzy devil. So an example is just Monday gone by. I was riding back. Uh, I went out to... Um, Warwick on the weekend, it was my granddad's 86th birthday, and I just rode the bike out there and motorbike, real, real bike, I'm not pedaling to Warwick, I don't have that sort of margin in my life, and I was coming back, and there was a police officer blocking the road, and it was right where Castle Main Brewery is, where you just come up over and go into Hale Street, heading on the way home, they blocked it completely, you cannot go through, you've got to go left or right. <clears throat> I just felt this incredible peace come over me and Holy Spirit just reminded me, Will, you're not in a rush. Yes, those rain clouds are coming, but I'm going to tell you, I'm going to get you through this dry. Just take a chill, turn right. And I just followed the road and I ended up getting to finding my way really easy, but there was this great peace over me. And I just like, I got so excited afterwards. I'm like, oh, that was my like thing, like that lost thing. And I like didn't do my thing where I just go like crazy. And it's just like, oh, wow. And I got home and it rained before I got to where I was going. It rained after me. But as I was going, I didn't get wet at all. And it was just amazing to experience. And you know, God's not surprised by our limitations. Our, the, the limitations that God put there, he knows all about. And he wants us to come to him in spite of them and with them and find him in them. And we've got different limitations at different times in our life. And as we get older, it's harder to embrace some of those limitations. And I'm finding that like just over mid-30s now, there's different limitations that I always thought was for those old people. And I'm realizing that I don't bounce back quite the same way as I used to. (laughs) Because there's different limitations that I either embrace or I get hurt and burnt by them. There's something beautiful about margin, but I, had, I created some margin in my life where I wasn't going to be angry at myself about it. And so I got this great piece. Margin is beautiful. So here's a couple of examples of people that dismissed boundaries. You know, when we called to, I believe we're born for more, but we're born for our more, not for other people's more. And when we try and operate in other people's more, here's what happens. 2 Chronicles 36, 20. In the book of Genesis... God created the heavens and the earth. He did it in six days. In the seventh day, he rested. And he first gave it to mankind as margin. He said, I did this and it was good. Now you do it. He invites us into it. 
then he has to give it to us as boundaries as well because it's like David says in Psalms, the Lord makes me to lie down in green pastures. You'd think we'd want to lie down in green pastures, but we're silly sheep often and we need to be made to lie down in good places. And so God puts the boundaries which he sets up in Exodus. But understand this, so the people of Israel had been asked, they'd been given the margin, then they'd given the boundaries to operate with Sabbath and they didn't. As a result, they were carried away into Babylon and the land of Israel lay desolate and kept the Sabbath to fulfill the 70 years that the prophet Jeremiah spoke and said, hey guys, you've got to take this Sabbath seriously because it's holy, it's set apart, it's a designated space for your healing, for you to recognize and respond to God himself. As a result, they went into captivity and the land had its Sabbath. See, this is actually law. It's brought in. It wasn't just an invitation in Genesis. It's law in Exodus. Remember the Sabbath. Keep it holy. Six days you'll labor and work. The seventh day is the Sabbath to God. Do no work. Not your son, not your daughter, not your male, not your female servant, cattle, stranger, anyone in your gates. In six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that's in it and rested on the seventh. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Holy, holy, set apart, designated space. You cannot keep God as holy in your life without the designated space to do so. Without making margin in your life for God to speak. I've gotten okay enough with my deficiencies. And, and it's, it's, you probably don't understand, but I hate being lost. Like it... There is very few things that frustrate me more. But as I've allowed God into that space and I've created margin in there, I just don't get as angry about it anymore. I get as lost. <laughs> if there's a choice of two ways to go, I'll find the third. Don't even know how it's possible. It's a, it's a gift. And it is a gift because it's a limitation that God has made me with that he's not surprised by and that I find him in when I surrender it to him. It is an absolutely beautiful gift. I don't feel like that most of the time, but it is. And see, God wants us to make room for him, to, to understand this margin. In Leviticus 10.1, the sons of Aaron did this really badly. Is They didn't understand holy and space set apart and, and what they should do and shouldn't do. You see, God had an instruction for a certain type of fire. He were talking about fire again in the boundaries to be offered to him. And they decided to bring a profane, an unholy, an unset apart, a foreign and an outside type of fire. They, they paid for that with their life. The first king of Israel, his role was king. Samuel's role was the prophet. Samuel was to come and to make the offering and the sacrifice. But Saul thought, Samuel's running late. I'm just going to do the job for him. And, and, and God speaks through Samuel there and says, obedience over sacrifice. And I wonder how much sacrifice we're making in work or sacrifice we're making in giving things up that's just simply not obedient to what God's call is for our life in our time, for what he's asking us to do right now. You can find those stories, Leviticus 10.1 for the sons of Aaron, 1 Samuel 13 for King Saul. You know, boundaries are important and so is margin. And you know what? I think we miss in the infinite, amazing power of God is how he embraces limitations. That he sent Jesus in the limitations of man. It wasn't an accident. And did you know that the God even limits himself? There's things that God cannot do. God's limited in that he cannot sin. He cannot be tempted to sin. He cannot tolerate sin. He cannot lie, cannot change, cannot break a promise. And God cannot stop loving you. God embraces those limitations that he set. And you know what? When the end of days come and we stand at the judgment seat, people will make a choice whether they live with God forever or without him. And hell is simply the limitation of the place without God, the place without love, the place without light, the place without life. 
God restricts and limits himself in a space for people that don't want anything to do with him. And when we don't embrace the space that God asks us to, we are being rebellious and we're, we're pushing. We're pushing against God. It's time that we slow down and stress less. I think we just need to be reminded that often Jesus withdrew. <laughs> he didn't do it once. He often withdrew because it was necessary for him. And you can read, the clearer he got on the path that he was to take, the more he withdrew. And the more he waited on God, the more he prayed. His prayers weren't, God, do this, 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 and this for me. His prayers, as we read in the Garden of Gethsemane, is God, not my will, but yours be done. He said no to his desires and yes to God's plan. And he needed margin in his life in order to operate in those boundaries. And if you think that you can, you can walk through your cross experience, take up your cross daily without margin, without time and space with God, you just can't. This is what happens in burnout. This is what happens when we run ahead of God's schedule. When we try and copy other people. It's not our place and space. And, and here's my challenge this morning, is that we would not be a people that when Jesus comes, that we've got no room in our inn because of the busyness in our environment. When Jesus was born as a man on earth, and Mary was about to give birth, there was no room in the inn. And, and I reckon that we could create, leave page intentionally blank, for dramatic pause. Create a designated parking space. There's something you might not be aware about the music team is that when they come here in the mornings, 7, 7.30, is they intentionally don't park in these first parks is because in their hearts, they're believing that that space that they don't occupy is going to be occupied by someone coming to church maybe for the first time that needs an easy place and space to be there. And it's part of their preparation in coming to serve as part of the worship team is that space. They're making space in their hearts and in their mind and their intention for these things to happen. And I think that's beautiful. And I wonder, friends, how we can make space. And if we understand that there's busyness coming, that we would leave a room vacant that Jesus would be able to occupy. That we, we would put up a no vacancy sign when we've We've come to the fullness of our life. We know where to say no because we've got to leave room for Jesus. We've got to leave room for Jesus. Maybe you've heard the song, I'm coming back to the heart of worship. The song was written that the pastor basically said, scrap it all. We're not doing services. We're not doing anything. So the guy who was leading worship goes, this will be interesting. And after a couple of months of not leading worship in that way, this song came out. We're coming back to the heart of worship where it's all about you. I'm sorry, God, for the thing I've made it. We, we make this religion thing, we make this stuff so busy. Just as a final scripture, I'll get the musos to come up. Here's an example of Mary and Martha, a couple of ladies in Jesus' world. And Martha was just so frustrated that she was doing all of the work. And Jesus' response to her is, Martha, Martha, William, William, you're worried and troubled about so many things, but there's one thing that's needed. Choose that good part and don't let it be taken away from you. <laughs> in the busyness and in the stuff and all of the things that could happen, would you make some intention to make some things happen? Would you, would you create some boundaries in your life? You know, the Bible has given us what these boundaries are to be. We just got to implement them and just give ourselves enough margin to be okay enough with ourselves that God's doing a work and He's not finished yet. Man, I get so frustrated by the defective parts of my world and my life. 
But when I'm okay with it enough to let Jesus love me as I am, but not leave me as I am, it's amazing the grace that comes in and brings the change that I can't bring with no matter how much I force it myself. And I believe that today God's looking for a people that would make room. They will get intentional about their space and be space men, women. They'll occupy the time, the area. That they would know what the personal space is needed to operate and be them that God's called them to be because the whole world will be blessed when we operate in our influence. Just stand this morning. I want God to breathe and speak upon your heart and life. I want you to think about what it looks like to slow down in traffic so the Holy Spirit can say there's an incident or a hazard or something ahead that you slow down in the traffic and busyness of life. There's a story of a Sulamite woman and she saw that the prophet would come past And she said to her husband, let's make a room, let's make a space that whenever he comes past, he can be here. As a result, when her son died, the prophet came and brought him back to life. As a result, when there was a great famine coming, the prophet said, get out of this land. And as a result, when she came back, the king heard that this is a woman that Elisha had done all these things for, and he restored all of her land. It's amazing what will happen when you make room. When you make room takes up your space by